Welcome to the Lean Process Development Virtual Summit. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about how to develop and teach standardized work in a variable work condition. As you may know, some years ago I bought a distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky and the work at the distillery is not cyclical and uh, sequential and so uh, I spent a bit of time thinking about how to best develop a work process and I'd like to try to take you through that uh, today. So in Toyota Talent uh, we reviewed first of all kind of the difference between standardized work and job instruction and uh, in this case, standardized work, really the purpose is to develop the best work method possible and then job instruction is used to develop people to perform the work in the best possible way. So people are oftentimes confused about those two things. Okay, standardized work, we want to develop the most effective method. Um, but I've also learned that once you understand the concepts of job instruction, you can use those ideas to help develop the best work method. So what I want to talk about particularly today is the work that we do at the distillery, in particular the startup work, uh, doesn't follow the same sequence every day depending on various things and I'll talk a little bit about that. But when I look at the job instruction method, typically it's taught to show, first you identify the steps, then you identify the key points, then you identify the reasons. In this case, what I've done is I've started with the reasons and I've said, based on these things, here's when I want to do this work. So we're determining when the steps are performed based on certain criteria that's occurring at the distillery on any given day. So, Part of the trouble I've experienced over the years, and I was taught job instruction uh, by the Japanese back in, in 1988, so I've been doing this for, for a number of years, but part of the trouble with job instruction is it's presented as if the work always follows a sequence of one, two, three, four, repeat. And of course, much of the work that we encounter today doesn't exactly follow that uh, series of repeating steps, okay? And the other part is that job instruction training implies that you're going to go through the steps with someone multiple times and you're going to present it to them, then they're going to present it back to you and, and they're going to be fully trained. But in a situation like a startup at the distillery, once you complete that task for the day, that task is finished and you're not going to undo that task and show it, show it again. So we have to do the training over multiple days and uh, more repetitions than, than typically presented. So again, in Toyota Talent, what we were showing here is that you can see that uh, quite a bit of the type of work that people do, whether you're in maintenance or uh, you're doing troubleshooting work or you're in leadership and you're making decisions, you're looking at policies and judgment and so on, um, that work doesn't follow a certain sequence, okay? So I think about it like a computer uh, program that has subroutines embedded in it. The subroutine is repeated uh, the same way each time, but the subroutine may or may not be activated based on some other uh, criteria that, that occurs. So uh, this is typical and people encounter trouble when they're trying to apply job instruction in this highly variable situation, okay? Uh, what I can say is the, the core concepts of job instruction apply to any type of work task and a task is anything that, that you're actually doing. Okay? It can be a thinking process, it can be a, a manual process, but in any case the idea, the core idea of uh, job instruction is to identify those key points uh, that as they taught us back then, make or break the job. So what I do then is I start with the reason that we do a certain thing. And, and from past experience, you can say the reason is to avoid a certain mistake that we know might occur. 
to, to do things in a more effective or efficient manner uh, or, or various things. And I'm going to show you some of the decision matrix uh, information that I use to try to determine what makes the most sense to do a, a certain thing a certain way. Okay. Um, the, the key here is that when a step occurs, just like a subroutine in, in a program, the when can vary. So literally, uh, when I say nothing's the same at the distillery every morning, that, that's not quite true. Uh, the individual elements and steps that I perform to do the startup are, are the same, but the sequence of events can change based on uh, certain circumstances. So I think what people often fail to do is to, to take a look at the entire work process, the work that's occurring, and ask the question, does this make a difference in some way? Okay. And when we look at work, we can understand that there's certain things that we do are going to have a, a greater significance and they're going to have more importance. And there's certain things that matter less or not at all. And when I ask people, uh, what would be your definition of standardized work? In most cases, people say that, that uh, we're going to do the work the, the same way, uh, indicating an exactness. And that's not really the case. Uh, there's certain things that are more critical than others that require uh, more careful attention. And then there's certain things that really don't matter that much at all. Uh, they're not going to affect the uh, performance overall. So you'll see as we go through these, I'm going to, the decision matrix that I'm going to show uh, is an indication of what's the greatest risk potential here, what's the possible mistakes that could be made, and what are the steps we can take to try to avoid those. Um, a lot of the work that, that we're doing is a manual nature, and we want to try to tell people sometimes to pay attention or make sure you don't forget or things like that. Uh, but those uh, ideas are typically very ineffective. So we wanted to develop some key points uh, to incorporate into the work to ensure that the things that we're doing uh, happen without mistakes and so on. So again, back to Toyota Talent, you know, really taking a look at the work and, and recognizing that only a very small portion of it is what I would call critical. That uh, minor variations in the work method are going to have some sort of negative effect, okay? Whether that's an error, uh, a defect, or some other thing, an injury, or so forth. So fortunately, there's very few things in the actual work method that have to be defined at a very specific and critical level. And then we've got another layer here, and this is just a rough breakdown potentially of the numbers to say, that there's other elements that are uh, important but not critical. In other words, the amount of deviation in the work method can be a little bit higher and still have a, a good outcome. And then finally we get down to the lower ends where, where things become less and less important and the method uh, that we perform the work doesn't need to be quite as detailed or specific. Okay, And, uh, you know, some people think that standardized work is defining every detail of the work, and that's actually not the case. You want to define the details very carefully with those things that matter the most. And uh, down here, you can accept the fact that there's going to be some variation. Okay, so when I look at the, the what I put together is a decision matrix and say, all right, first of all, there's a priority time-wise to do certain things before other things because they dictate the timing. And so at the distillery, uh, one of the things we do is pump either into or out of tanks. And that's a process that you don't have to stand and watch. Uh, in some cases, not at all. In some cases, more closely, and I'll describe that. Okay, Looking at things like the what takes the most amount of time. So I want to start those tasks early because they take longer to perform. And uh, one of the issues at the distillery is that the uh, run time of the still dictates the length of the day. And when you're the person who starts the day and ends the day, uh, that becomes a long day and you want to try to uh, 
you know, make that as uh, short as possible. Okay. So then, of course, is risk. And risk is a formula that says what's the probability of the occurrence of some event uh, times the consequence of that. So if the probability is high and the consequence is high, the risk is high, and those are the ones that you want to really develop some, some very uh, sound key points related to. Okay. Then we have both manual and automatic processes. The automatic ones can, can be done without direct supervision in some cases. Uh, in some cases you have to uh, organize it in such a way that you can still maintain uh, close observance of those while performing other tasks. And then the sequence itself. Some things obviously have to happen before others. Some things can be uh, left till later. And so that's a decision to make each day looking at the situation and deciding, do I need to do that task right now? Or is that a task I can do somewhat later? Of course, the risk of waiting to do it later is either forgetting to do it uh, and or getting a busy, sidetracked, uh, distracted. These are all common things that that uh, lead to mistakes. So we have to be careful uh, with that. And there's certain things that I try to match up together to say this task and this task need to be done as a sort of a subroutine because it makes sense to do that and prevent some uh, other occurrence, which I'll explain. And then there's concurrent steps, uh, just what I said. So there's certain things that make sense to do at the same time. And so if I'm going to do this one, I need to do that one also at the same time. Okay, so what are the goals uh, of the startup? First of all, uh, we don't want to lose any product. And I'm going to show you that we have uh, basically three different things there with uh, uh, decreasing values to them. The finished distillate, obviously, and the uh, ready to go into a barrel in the finished form is the most valuable of those and uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose any of that due to any kind of mistakes. Uh, missed steps, uh, errors, mistakes, whatever you want to call those things, but forgetting to do a particular step has a consequence and uh, could result in loss of product or uh, uh, loss of time. Okay. Uh, trying to get things started as early as possible, as I mentioned, that, that dictates the length of the day. And then uh, least probably the least significant there is to minimize the amount of work. Uh, normally standardized work is developed to try to eliminate waste, amuda. In this case it's the uh, least significant. I'll find that I walk back and forth a lot to make sure that the things that I'm doing uh, that are more important uh, occur. So there's a lot of physical movement involved in this process as you'll see in a, in a moment. So, it's never the same. Well, the whole process is not the same from day to day and it's based on various things which I'll, I'll explain. But what we need to do and uh, the actual task itself is the same. When that task occurs can vary. There's certain things that I always try to do first, for example, uh, to get them started. But then there's other tasks that, that can be done at a different time depending on the situation. Okay. Uh, in, in job instruction, to me, always the, the really important aspect, the core concept of job instruction is, is the how something is done. Again, in this case, it's also a when is something done. So I look at the situation and I say, it's best to do this task at this time because of this reason. So I can start with the reasons and work back into the how and then uh, define the what. So a little bit opposite of the normal <clears throat> way the job instruction is, uh, is presented. So um, the idea that standardized work is always the same is not quite true. The, the sequence isn't quite the same, but the actual work content that is performed is the same. So, <clears throat> what are the things that cause uh, the variation? First of all, uh, there's a question of what happened on the previous day. We are working with uh, natural organism yeast, and uh, we expect that the yeast is going to perform its work, but it doesn't always uh, cooperate. We do the same 
cooking process each day to produce the same amount of fermentable uh, material each day and you would assume then that if that process is going to work that you're going to have the same amount ready to go into the stills each day but uh, that's not the case. Some days nothing is finished fermenting therefore that means the following day there's going to be nothing to actually go into the stills. So the startup is quite abbreviated there's nothing to, to do in the stills just a matter of uh, setting up the cooker. Okay. Uh, some days three of the totes finish fermenting even though we only cook two totes each day. So some days it's three, some days it's none, some days it's two, and all of those things are going to dictate what has to happen at the startup in the morning. So the next piece then is what are we going to do today? So we typically change our uh, recipe uh, weekly, and so at the end of one of the cycles then, <clears throat> I have to be aware that uh, we're going to load the stills with uh, a new fermented recipe, which means that the distillate from the previous batch has to be taken out of the collection tanks before the stills start. And so that's going to determine the sequence of events that I take there. Uh, another thing is we don't have the capability to completely fill a barrel in a single day. So we oftentimes have uh, a day when I completed a barrel yesterday, but I have a brand new barrel to start today. Or I half filled a barrel yesterday, therefore I have a half a barrel to fill today. Or have a barrel three quarters of the way full and only need to put a quarter more in it, which means there will be a second barrel that gets started that day. So all these things uh, are, are going to dictate the work method that, that I use. And then finally, on top of that, uh, we don't want to start the cooker. If I go back to the point where we say uh, some of the fermentation didn't finish, that means those totes that we expected to have available to do another cook are still occupied. And therefore, we can't actually cook that day because we don't have an empty tote to put that material into. So all of those things uh, are going to change the work that's done and the sequence that it's done in. So if I look at just a quick list of the uh, of the tasks, first I want to get the set back from the steel. That's the liquid that's left in the steel after the operation. We use that to put back in the next cooking uh, water. That helps to lower the pH and give the yeast a favorable environment. Uh, we need to fill the stills. We're going to fill the doublers on the stills. Uh, have to light the stills to get them started. Uh, and put the distill into barrels and then uh, set up the heads collection containers, which I'll explain as best I can. So if you look at those things, and what I tried to do here is try to show you those tasks and then identify the level of importance or, or significance to those tasks. Uh, Really nothing that we do is, is super critical, make or break. Uh, there's certain things that make sense to do in a certain time and a certain way, but there's a, a little bit more latitude for most things. And then I've identified then what are the probable mistakes. Now that's easy to identify because every one of those mistakes has been done. Well, those are things that we know from history are, are uh, likely to some degree. And uh, that's how we develop the key points. We can develop the key point to uh, minimize or prevent some of those uh, possible mistakes. And when you look at the probability of the mistakes, then we can see based on experience that some of those tend to occur more often or have occurred more often and uh, some of those less often. Uh, when I was thinking about those now, we've, we've incorporated some corrective measures. So in today's reality, most of the probabilities are low because we've actually incorporated some uh, countermeasures into the work method. But if I were looking back over time to say how likely was that or how often did that occur, uh, it might have been higher. And then the consequence itself. So 
most of the things that we do, if you fail to do it properly or you make some mistake, you forget to do a particular step, it's not a big deal. Um, but some of them, again, the loss of product or loss of materials, those are the most significant things uh, that are going to happen. There's not a whole lot of risk in, in terms of uh, safety or, or other things of that nature, but mostly uh, forgetting to close the drain valve on the still and then you put the liquid in the still and realize it's all going down the drain. So that's not a good thing. And then here's some of the corrective measures that we've incorporated into the work method and I'll describe some of those as we go uh, to the next slide here. So this is kind of a, a, a rough bird's eye view of the distillery. We have three stills uh, typically in operation. We do have a fourth still, but it's not operated as often. So I just uh, showed the three stills here. And you can see the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to start that pump to drain that still. The other two stills have been drained previously at the end of the uh, prior day. So those are all ready to be filled, but this one has to be drained because that's where we collect the setback. So I'll start the pump and then I'll come over here and I'll remove the two uh, filler caps that are on the top of the still. Then I'll come around over here and uh, drain the doublers. And this is a case where draining the doublers and removing the filler caps at the same time is one of those concurrent steps uh, makes sense. Okay. Then come over here to those two stills and uh, close the drain valves. That's it. That's kind of an important key point there. Um, and then on step five, when I actually begin to fill the tanks, there's a visual double check. So I can see the drain valve from that point and I always look at it to, to double check and verify that I've closed it. Uh, that's, that's a difficult one because in your mind, you know you just closed it, but it's always a good idea to do a double check because it's an important step. And uh, I'll show you what we learned at Toyota at the very last slide here is uh, called Yosh, which means check. So you kind of point at that thing to indicate that you've done that. Okay. Then while I'm filling the still, the still requires a certain amount of liquid and I need to pay attention because this uh, tote that we're using to fill it that would be here is used to fill both stills. So I'm going to put a certain amount in one still and then I'm going to reserve a certain amount for the other still. So you'll see I do steps six and seven and eight and nine directly uh, there so that I can observe the pump because it doesn't have an automatic shutoff or anything like that. So I can observe that and, and still pay uh, close attention to that. Okay. Then this pump is running. We want to make sure that it doesn't run dry. So at some point, I'll come back over here to double check that. And you can see, check the level in the still. And if it's still, uh, if there's still more to be pumped out, then I can proceed to go do some other steps. But you'll see here, this is OK. This is a follow up step. Make sure you go back and check that pump to see how it's coming. Because I want to finish that as quickly as possible and begin draining that still because that's the, that's the step that determines ultimately the length of the day. Okay. So what you'll see in certain cases is there's going to be some redundancies and there's going to be some uh, uh, checks, some double checks to verify that certain things are done. So for example, when you come back over here, to then fill the doublers, you also want to go ahead and put the caps back on because if you don't do that and then you come back later when the still is operating uh, and those caps aren't in place, you have an, an issue. Okay, So you might be able to see if I had the lines connecting all the, the dots that there's quite a bit of walking back and forth and this whole process can take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half to uh, complete. So what are the decisions based on? Again, that decision matrix that I showed, start the setback pump as, as early as possible. Uh, that's going to dictate the length of the total day, and the total day can be 12 hours or more, so it's important to get that going. 
Uh, there's certain steps, as I said, filling the stills. It's an automatic operation and you can do other things, but you still have to keep an eye on it and make sure that it doesn't get overfilled. Um, this setback pump, there's not a lot of risk, but you don't want to run a pump dry. If you run the pump dry, you can damage the pump. So you want to keep an eye on that. And it's relatively easy to check the process, the progress, and see how that's coming, okay? And so those are the things that when I'm doing the sequence, I have to say, okay, at this point, I need to go back and check that and see where it is. All right, it's not ready yet. Now I can go and complete these other steps, and then I have to come back and do that. So, uh, again, I've reiterated this several times to get the still started as quickly as possible. That's going to dictate the length of the day. Uh, since this is something that I think people don't understand sometimes when they're developing the work uh, process, it matters to me to get that started because I'm the same person who's going to start it and I'm the same person who's going to shut it down. So the length of the day is uh, important to me and therefore that's part of my decision making process. Okay, uh, so we've experienced this. It's, it's very easy sometimes to forget certain things like close the drain valve and so we've incorporated, as I said, some redundancies in there. Uh, so I'll make sure that uh, if the drain valve is left open from the previous day, that's also a standard indicator of the status. So there's certain things that we have, a, uh, the, the standard, if you will, is visual. So if the cap is not on the doubler and the drain valves are open, that's an indication that the doublers have not been filled yet. And so if someone else were to come in during the middle of that sequence, they could understand where I am in the work process, okay? Um, it, and so, again, that hierarchy is a finished distal. It is the most valuable. Then the tails, the uh, portion at the end of the run, has a higher alcohol content, but we can recycle that. And then the fermented mash that, that goes into the still. Uh, we've worked hard to get that. We definitely don't want that to go down the drain. So looking at this for filling a barrel, okay, the risk or the failure is uh, to spill and or lose the distilled spirit. Uh, you're, sometimes the temptation we've discovered is instead of standing there and watching something, you feel like you want to be productive and to complete other tasks. But there's certain times where it's more important to stay and observe and watch. Uh, so. The consequence of losing the distillate is, is high. We don't want to uh, spill it on the floor. So if we're beginning with an empty barrel, I can put that under any still and uh, open the valve and, and walk away from that because none of the stills produces enough to completely fill a barrel. So there's no risk that that barrel is going to overfill. If the barrel is already partially filled, depending on how much it is, then I can also make that decision. So I know, okay, I put 10 gallons in that 53 gallon barrel. I have approximately 20 gallons in this still. There's no risk that that's gonna overfill. So again, I can open that valve and, and walk away from that, but maybe come and check it just to be on the safe side. Then if, if there's any question whatsoever, and this is a lesson we learned the hard way, if there's any question whatsoever that that barrel could possibly overfill when you're not there, uh, you stand there with a flashlight and you check it and see what the level is. And uh, as that gets near to the top, then you have to be more uh, diligent on observing that. Okay, so those are the rules I use uh, for myself when I'm thinking about uh, filling the barrel with the final distillate. And so at the end of all this, because of the possibilities of uh, getting distracted, sidetracked, um, interrupted, you know, those kind of things that occur, and uh, because of some abnormality you get out of your normal routine, uh, it is possible to forget to do certain things. For example, put the cap back on the still, okay? Uh, 
it's intended that as soon as the still is full and you remove the, the uh, fill nozzle that you would put the cap on but as life would happen sometimes something else is occurring at that time and you get pulled away from that and then forget to go back to that. So one of the things that Toyota did in that case for, for important things is a double check. So once I've completed all the tasks I'll go back to each still and I'll check and I'll say okay the fill cap is closed, those valves are closed, that's in the correct position, that switch is on, that's set up correctly, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'll go through each one of those items again to verify that that work has been done uh, correctly. Okay, That's a hard lesson sometimes for people because I did the work. I have to believe in my own mind that I did it correctly, but the fact of the matter is there's many things that cause uh, distraction or just the variation itself causes you sometimes to forget certain steps. So these are useful things to, to do to go back and, and just make a confirmation uh, step at the very end. Okay. So with that, uh, I encourage you to to think about the work from the standpoint of maybe starting with the key point and the reasons. Why is it recommended to do a certain thing a certain way? When should that be performed? What is that decision based on? So when you're trying to teach someone that work process, you can say that normally I would do this because of this. This is the way I would typically do this. Uh, when, when I teach people, I want to show them the typical first to, to help them understand that. But then I can come back and say, okay, here's an alternative. If something else happens, it's possible to do it this other way, that you can change the sequence of those things. But I try not to, to mix those together in the same conversation because that creates uh, confusion. So the first thing is, this is what normal would be, even though there technically isn't uh, exactly a normal. Or I can show the subroutine pieces and I can say, anytime you do this task, you're always going to follow this particular uh, sequence. Now that sequence can vary in the overall sequence when it occurs, but, um, but the, anyway, that's, that's a way to help present that in a way to, to make it so that it's not confusing more than it could be. So with that, I thank you very much and look forward to any uh, commentary that you have. You're welcome to shoot me a question or things, and we look forward to seeing you in person in for real in the future. Thank you.